Let's look at the concept of control structures and learn about the three basic control structures that we'll use when developing our programs. The third type of control structure is looping, also called iteration and repetition. So this is a question. You ask yourself a question. Notice there's a decision structure again. So this is your decision. And this question is going to be true or false, just like an if statement. Now with the if statement, you only ask the question one time. Is the hours more than 40 or not? But with a loop, you keep re-asking this. Okay, so um, try again. Okay, try again. And if I say yes, okay, it's going to do it again. Try it. And I'll keep doing it. How long will it keep doing it? Until I finally say no, and then it'll come that way. Okay, so it keeps asking. You want to try again? Sure. Now this try again is just only one possible condition. So we will learn different types of conditions. The most common type of condition you're going to put in the loop is called a counter. So let's, let's think about pay again. Let's say I'm writing this payroll application for uh, Deer Harvester and they have 1,200 employees. So does that mean that logic that I had in the previous slide, I have to duplicate 1,200 times? Well, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count how many I've processed so far. So if I'm supposed to process 1,200, I'm going to keep count as long as count is less than or equal to 1,200. So when I start, count is equal to 1. Okay? And I'm getting ready to process the first. This is all that processing steps from payroll right here. So I'll be getting ready to process that first set of logic and I'll add one. So now it counts two. And I'll keep doing it. I'm on the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. I'm on the hundredth one. I'm on the two hundredth. And it keeps looping until it gets to twelve hundred. After it gets to twelve hundred and one, there's no one else's paycheck to calculate and you're out of the loop. Well, what if, you forget, what if you forget to add one to the count? Oh, I process John, get the next one. I process Mary, get the next one. But it keeps saying count is one. What's going to happen? Well, what happens is called an infinite loop. So if you ever had a program that maybe would hang up, I'm not saying the reason it hung up was an infinite loop, but that's a possibility. An infinite loop is a loop that will never, ever end, and it's the programmer's fault if there's an infinite loop. So the only way to get out of an infinite loop, say if you're on a Windows machine, control, delete, and end the program or reboot your computer. So let's look at the types of loops um, that you can have. One's called a do until. So a do until means do this until this condition is true. So keep looping. Is the condition false? Keep looping. So this is not a do until because we're looping when it's true. A do while is as long as your condition is true, you keep looping. Once the condition becomes false, you exit the loop. And a for loop was like that last example I gave you where your count. I want, a, I want to calculate exactly 1,200 paychecks, for example. Okay, so suppose I'm going to create a loop for a basketball game and there are four quarters. And so you're going to loop until you get to quarter five. So as long as we're less than or equal to four, as long as that's true, we're going to play a quarter. Okay? So first of all, I want you to know, I want you to notice quarter. That's a variable, right? So it contains a number. And this is really a counter control loop too. This is this quarter is called the loop control variable. So this quarter is called the loop control variable. And before you can do a comparison, it has to have an initial value. If quarter didn't have any data in it, I couldn't compare it to four. So notice before the loop starts, you initialize that variable to, in this case, we're going to initialize it to one. We're going to start in the first quarter. Then we have our test. We're testing whether we want to go into the loop. And in this case, if quarter is 1, and 1 is less than or equal to 4, we'll go into the loop. And then what we're going to do is play the quarter. 
buzzer goes off at the end of the buzzer, what do we do? We say, okay, we're going to get ready for quarter two. And so how do we get ready for quarter two? I'll go ahead and put that symbol there. Well, we take what's in quarter, which is one. We add one to it. So one plus one is two. And then two gets reassigned into quarter. So now we're in the second quarter. When you hit the end while, you will loop back up and you test again. Okay, two is less than or equal to four. We play the second quarter. Now we'll be in the third, loop back up. Three is less than or equal to four. We'll play the quarter. Increment quarter after the quarter's over. It's at four now. We loop back up. It's true again. We play the fourth quarter. Becomes quarter five. Ah, five is not less than or equal to four. That's a false statement. And then we'll do whatever statements are below and while. So here's an example of a uh, App Inventor. Now remember App Inventor is for Android applications. So it could be like for someone's smartphone. So let's say I'm going to write an application that when someone clicks some button called text group button, it allows for group text. So in group text, we're going to have a message and we're going to have one message but multiple phone numbers. Okay, so what we could do is we could create the message and then we can do this series of really almost the exact same logic. Okay? And so if you're doing series of the exact same logic, then that's perfect for putting in a loop. So we're going to assign the phone number and send this message. Assign the phone number, send the message, etc. So let's see what we can do in a loop. So this is sequence, but because of the nature of this sequence, it should be a loop. Okay, so an App Inventor, what you're going to do for assigning those phone numbers, you're going to create what App Inventor calls a list. So here it's going to be a list of phone numbers. Then the logic for the click event for that button is we still create the text messages, okay, but we're going to do a loop. This is a counter controlled loop for each item in the list, for each item in this list. We're going to grab that item, which is the phone number, and we're going to send a text message. What list? In this list here, notice that that's the same name. So every item in this list, get the phone number and send the message. It just loops through it. You don't have to individually send it like you did here. Okay, so that kind of wraps up an introduction to our basic structures. Remember, sequence structure where you do step A, then you do step B, then you do step C. That's the first one. The selection or decision structure says that you have some condition and you're either going to branch on the, you know, to the true part or to the false part of that condition. And then the loop, oh, you also have a condition, but instead of branching, you're going to keep asking that and doing the same set of statements until the condition becomes false and then you exit the loop. Now it is possible, in fact most programs, only the very simplest programs when you're first learning will only have one control structure and that will be sequence. But even by the time you get to past the second or third program, you're nesting different structures together. So in this example, I have a decision structure. You're going to do this side or this side. The false side, notice, has a sequence nested inside. So here is a sequence of steps nested inside a decision. Here's the pseudocode for that, okay? Notice there's only one step in the true, but a sequence of steps in the false part of that condition. Why are we doing this? First of all, when you write programs, you will have other people reading your source code probably, especially if you do open source. But a lot of times your first job as a programmer will be opening someone else's source code up and making modifications to their program. Don't you want to be able to read what they wrote? So readability, the ability to read the source code and using structured programming allows for that. Another thing about structure is multiple programmers can work on the same program because a part of structure is modularity. So I always like to use Word because I think of the ribbon, right? And in the ribbon, there's a spell check, for example, command, and there's a thesaurus command. 
Well, I can actually think of that as two different modules that could be reused, actually. So I can have one programmer work on the spell check, another on the thesaurus. Well, that spell check that they worked on Word, I can take that module and stick it in PowerPoint. Can I spell check in PowerPoint? Why write two modules that do the same thing? So it also helps speed up, it helps team programming, it helps speed up the process of programming, and it helps identify your errors more quickly. Okay. In summary, what we talked about were the three basic control structures, sequence, decision, and loop. We're going to practice reading some, some code to see that we can read and understand the paths that can be taken um, with these algorithms using these structures in the coming weeks.